Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Sergei Maslov. Uh, Sergei got his education at the Moscow Institute for Physics and Technology um, and then came to this country. He's a physicist by training. Um, and he came to this country uh, first to finish to do his graduate work at Stony Brook University, what well, was sunny Stony Brook at the time, I think, and then spent the rest of his career until recently at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, he experienced during his tenure at Brookhaven a revelation that maybe biology was just as interesting as physics or that what he had learned in physics was applicable to biology. Um, Sergei moved to Illinois just recently. He came here uh, just in August, about a month ago, uh, with a primary appointment in the Department of Bioengineering and uh, a, an affiliation at NCSA and at IGB and I think also a foot in the Department of Physics, kind of his old love. And uh, he is going to be telling us about models of genome evolution and ecosystem dynamics, kill the winner, kill the losers, kill the king, and I don't know where this massacre is going to end, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, by the way, um, I was explicitly asked to let you know that after this there will be some refreshments in the lobby and that you are all cordially invited to uh, have some of these refreshments and get more opportunities to talk with our speaker and maybe with each other. Thank you very much, Victor, for the introduction and Ed and Gabriel for inviting me to give this colloquium. This is a, a new crowd for me. Again, with my physics background, I'm used to give talks uh, in the audience of physicists or biologists or any mixture thereof. And here I see quite a few computer scientists in the audience. And so don't blame me if I don't get all the computer science uh, terminology right or, you know, or if I will mess up my computer science. Uh, that's not really my primary field, but I'm learning computing and I'm actually quite excited about applying computing. Um, so we live in a very exciting time and uh, when biology is being transitioned from the primarily descriptive side, science to, uh, to becoming, rapidly becoming a predictive science. Uh, and uh, uh, um, what is really driving it, uh, this transition, is this explosion in data uh, in a volume of biological, primarily genomic data, which we started to accumulate about 20 years ago, and it's accelerating exponentially. And I, I feel almost like I'm contractually obligated to show this slide, even though uh, you probably saw it many times in previous talks. This slide just shows that the cost of sequencing, of genome sequencing, uh, uh, has this unprecedented time course where it dropped by almost three orders of magnitude in uh, just a handful of years. And for reference, here is this uh, straight line, here is Moore's law. So as you see, the sequencing does much, much better than Moore's law in the past 10 years at least. And uh, as a consequence of this, the data also grows uh, exponentially. So this is uh, this plot which goes all, all the way up to the uh, uh, current year uh, is uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, gene sequences. So this one billion means one billion genes and each gene is roughly 1,000 nucleotides long on average. Uh, so you have to multiply it by 1,000 to get the volume of data. And this is just one repository, the NCBI NIH repository. And uh, there are other you know, private companies that accumulate data, and there are other uh, organizations with do which don't upload their data to uh, NCBI. In particular, what is not reflected in this curve is this explosion in metagenomic data. Some of you have heard uh, Larry Smart's colloquium at the uh, uh, Carl was symposium last weekend, and he was talking primarily about a human microbiome data. And that's really, in terms of data volumes, that's a big driver. So again, our collection of data 
is rapidly growing, but when I hear the word collection, I always remember the quote of Rutherford, who said, all sciences are either physics or STEM collecting. Right? And you know, being physicists, I want, and being physicists who converged to biology about 15 years ago, and who really a firm believer in biology and believer in the future of biology, I, I think that the, the biology, in order to move beyond STEM collecting phase, uh, it needs two things. It needs to put all this data in one place and integrate it well together, and it needs predictive models. It needs predictive models which would allow people to, uh, uh, to, to predict outcome of the experiments uh, before they are done and refine the models as the experiments are done. And uh, a model is a very efficient way of storing knowledge. In other words, you know, data is not knowledge, data is data. In order to store knowledge, you need to condense it into a model. And that's what biology as a field right now is, is doing uh, uh, at an unprecedented scale. So this whole thing was not lost on, on my primary funder for the past 20 years or so, the DOE, Department of Energy. Uh, so about four years ago, they started a project, even though the project was in the discussion phase for 15 years or so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the project's name is uh, Systems Biology Knowledge Base. And I want, want to emphasize the word knowledge base, so it is well beyond the database. So the, the project's focus is on predictive modeling of biological systems, and being funded by DOE, we are interested in microbes, all kinds of microbes, including archaea, which are beloved uh, uh, pet of this university, uh, 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 plants, and with plants we are sort of focused on model plants and on the plants which are relevant for DOE mission, and microbial or plant microbial communities. And again, as I already mentioned, the environmental metagenomics generates a massive volumes of data. The data is very interesting. It opens up the window on not just on individual organisms, but how they interact with each other, how they form ecosystems, and so on. But the project is a primarily a computational infrastructure project. So here is my connection to the computer scientists in the audience. So this is an open source uh, software. We keep all our code on GitHub. Uh, we need a data model because we are a knowledge base and we want to propagate the knowledge accumulated in one organism to other organisms. So we need to store all our data in one place and to use it for knowledge discovery and for knowledge propagation. And our UI uh, is based primarily on IPython interface, or as it was recently renamed, it's a Jupyter now. In fact, the PI and the founder of the IPython is, works with us on a project. He is a pro program manager for our, uh, project manager for our project, Fernando Perez. When Fernando learns that I'm moving here to Urbana, he gave me a long, long list of people at NCSA and computer science department whom I should get in touch with. So I'm still following up on this list. So, uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, a little bit more about the project. There are four labs, four national labs involved. Uh, the main lab, the, the PI of the project is Adam Markin at Berkeley. And then Rick Stevens, many of you know Rick, who is your neighbor and also a high performance computing guru at Argonne. Myself at Brookhaven and Cold Spring Harbor and uh, Bob Cottenham at Oak Ridge. So enough about projects, and let's just uh, let me give you a, a briefly a flavor of data and uh, and uh, and things we are working on in the K base. So what is shown here is a principal component analysis of roughly 7,000 uh, gene expression samples in a model plant. This Arabidopsis is basically a weed, but being having a relatively small genome for plants and being a model organism from early days of plant biology, that's by far the organism for which we have the largest volume of uh, systems biology data. And so this is 7,000 expression samples. Just to give you an idea what an expression sample is, uh, all of the 20,000 plus genes in an organism uh, under a particular condition or a particular tissue, uh, those, some of those genes are expressed, others remain silent. So each uh, condition and the tissue is represented by a 20,000 dimensional vector of expression levels of those genes, which are measured by originally by microarray technology and now by next generation sequencing technologies. So we have sort of collected all this data together and uh, what is shown here is 7,000 of those samples and again, what, uh, the, the main point of, of this plot is that you can see how those 
even uh, a very simple-minded computational te technique like a principal component analysis shows you how those samples cluster primarily by their tissue, by the part of the plant they were isolated in. And this is very useful for us, not only because it allows us to classify uh, the data, but it also allows us to uh, recover some of the missing labels. So if we'll see a sample which uh, people who did the experiment forgot to annotate, and that happens all the time, and seeing that it's right in the middle of this, uh, uh, you know, leaf shoot and, uh, and stem uh, uh, pi part of the, of the diagram, we can tentatively annotate it as, as, as this tissue. So that's how we can recover some of the missing information, which is a great, uh, great problem. This is another related problem, what I call a network of networks. So each node in this network is a network itself. So each node, every single node, is a co-expression network consistent of all, you know, this is a network consistent of all pairs of genes which have similar expression profiles under a variety of conditions. And again, they are colored by the tissue in which they were isolated, and they are connected if those two co-expression networks are sufficiently similar to each other. For people who are working on networks, they know that you can uh, have two networks in the same set of nodes, and you can map the similarity between the networks by, say, looking at how many edges they share and so on. And that just shows you how uh, sort of a knowledge in those co-expression networks can be discovered at this meta-network level. And uh, uh, finally, one more big data plot before I, uh, before I finish with the KBase project and move to my own primary, primarily scientific interests. Uh, so I mentioned that the metagenomics data uh, is growing very rapidly. In fact, just nine of the massive metagenomic samples in the soil uh, has about 40 million proteins, and just to put it in a context, all of the uh, sequenced, uh, uh, whole genome sequenced uh, non-metagenomic samples at around 2011 were 13 million proteins. And those uh, blue points here are sort of a sample of some of the metagenomic uh, uh, projects along with a number of uh, proteins, uh, a number of genes encoding proteins in, in those metagenomics projects discovered in the course of those metagenomic projects. So as you see, individual projects are comparable on the scale to all of the sequenced organisms, which number in uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands by now. So one of the things we are working on in KBase, and that's sort of in the future of the KBase, that's not immediately available, but that's in our sort of a skunk work projects with Rick Stevens again and a number of other collaborators in other national labs, is to construct this really massive a database of sequence similarities between those proteins. That will include all of the reference genomes and all of the metagenomes. And uh, to give you a scale of this project, we expect that very soon we will reach about a 1 billion protein sequences. And if all of them had some level of similarity with each other, which we would bother to keep, we would be dealing with 10 to the power 18 pairs of sequences. Of course, this is too large a number to store right now, so Fortunately, the network of those similarities is sparse, so we can, we can store a, a small subset of it. But nevertheless, that is something which requires us to think about the modern uh, techniques of data storage and, uh, and data retrieval and so on. And I am uh, very happy to talk to those of you guys here at uh, NCSA who are working on related problems either in biology or in other fields like astronomy, for instance. So uh, now I am done with sort of giving a, a, a pitch for my project. Now I want to talk science about and uh, uh, biological models are really, uh, uh, you know, biological organisms are complex systems and they can be modeled at multiple levels of resolution. So at a most kind of basic level, they can be, which you may call a zero dimensional or one dimensional model, it would be a genome. A zero dimension, if I view a genome as just a collection of genes, parts list, or one dimensional if I actually am interested in how they are positioned along the chromosome. The networks, which, is, uh, which were uh, really the, the main sort of field of systems biology where I, when I entered the field about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, can be thought of as a wiring diagram between those, uh, between those genes, between those parts. And uh, you can call them, quote unquote, two-dimensional model. And when I say two-dimensional model, you can think about the network being somewhat similar to a wiring diagram of a microchip or something. It tells you which parts interact with which other parts and how strong. 
But of course, in order to properly understand the biological uh, organism, you need to construct a, a three-dimensional or four-dimensional model. By four-dimensional, I mean I want to understand how all those genes and the proteins they encode are localized in space, within the cell, within tissues, you know, how tissues are building up, the organism are uh, uh, positioned together. And you need to add a time to this, uh, to this picture. And the time, again, can, can happen on multiple, multiple scales, as I, will, as I will describe in the next slide. So roughly speaking, the field of systems biology is somewhere between this two-dimensional and three-dimensional phase. What I'm saying in between that, you know, people, when we start, first started getting those high throughput, large-scale data about biological networks uh, in early 2000s, you know, everybody was excited and the feeling was that, well, we will very soon understand how things are wired together. And then the revelation came that, you know, the network is nothing but a skeleton and you need to put dynamics on the skeleton in order to properly understand how the system works. So right now we, we do have a lot of data on just the topology of those networks and we are in the process, in a very laborious and process which will take many decades of modeling the dynamical processes on those networks. So I personally work on uh, multiple timescales of biological models. Uh, some of those models I will not present today for, for interests of time, but at a very fast time scale, we are talking about intracellular dynamics, how the proteins and genes are being expressed, how they interact with each other, how different uh, 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 dynamical processes change in the course of you know, minutes to hours uh, to milliseconds on the other end. Uh, and then what I will be talking about today is I will give you two vignettes. I will start with evolutionary dynamics of bacterial genomes, which is, of course, a very, very long time scale. Everybody knows that evolution works on a scale of millions of years, you know, at least thousands of years to millions of years to ultimately, if you go all the way to the, or to the uh, you know, last common ancestor of all living species, we will be talking about several billion years. Uh, and then I will also talk about population dynamics. And population dynamics is something which happens on a human time scale. So we, we all see how ecosystems change in time. We can see for sort of ecosystems we care about, like tropical forests or so on, we can see how tree abundances might go down or how some uh, uh, infections can, uh, can wipe out entire populations of, of, of creatures. There was recently in the news this story about how some antelopes uh, in uh, Central Asia, a massive die off, you know, uh, a significant portion of the entire population died off. So I will, I will show you a model which we cooked up for uh, how populations, uh, 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 reflecting the population dynamics in very uncertain environments where populations can collapse. And at the same time, populations compete with each other and live in an environment where they are saturating it to the carrying capacity. So all other points here I put on just so that uh, you, know, you, you guys will be aware of what are you know, of the spectrum of my scientific interests. So I will only be talking about the things which are underlined. So let me first start with the um, evolutionary model, and this would be a model of horizontal gene transfer in bacterial, uh, in bacterial genomes. So uh, again, I, I, I fully understand that, that uh, a lot of you guys don't really know uh, uh, much about bacterial evolution, so I will give you a very, very brief primer of what what we mean by horizontal gene transfer. When a bacterium divides, when one bacterium gives rise to two daughter cells, uh, in biological jargon, it's called a vertical transmission of uh, genomic information. So whatever the genome a mother had, its two daughters will have almost the same genome, except that occasionally some part of the genome, one letter or several letters, will be mutated. And that's how the new sort of information is being born. And uh, uh, what, what uh, the, the genomic studies of, uh, of a past decade revealed is that the bacterial genomes are much, much more flexible than just the vertical transmission of information, that they are constantly exchanging genes with each other. So there is a sort of a bacterial bit torrent operating where they are constantly swapping bits and pieces of the genome, and that's what is called the horizontal transfer. And there are three basic principal mechanisms. Each of them has a biological name, which I don't want you to remember, but I, I will present them as a death, sex, and viruses. Right? A death is if bacterial cell dies and it releases uh, DNA, which was in the cell, to the environment, 
some other cells, which are in a proper state, can absorb some bits and pieces of the genome of dead bacteria and incorporate them in their own genomes. The viruses means that a virus can infect the bacterium. That's a special type of virus. By the way, that's not a, 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 a science fiction. That's a realistic depiction of some of those bacterial viruses called bacteriophages, and they really look like alien spacecrafts, right? So they infect the bacteria. They kill the bacteria in the process, but occasionally, by mistake, they incorporate bits and pieces of bacterial genome into their own head, and when they invade another bacterium, they do not necessarily kill it right away, and some of those bits and pieces of genome will be incorporated into recipient cell genome. So by doing this, they are spreading the genes around in a horizontal way. And finally, bacteria like all of us have their own version of sex, where they really, a pairs of bacteria come together and exchange bits and pieces of, you know, circular bits of a genome. And again, when I'm saying that the bit torrent, I really mean those two top examples because this is one-on-one -on -one communication, whereas this many-to-many -many communication. So why, why, why should we even bother to know about bacterial horizontal gene transfer? Uh, well, it turns out to be very, very practically important. So, uh, you know, we are being infected by bacteria, and some of the benign bacteria can suddenly become pathogenic. And when they are becoming pathogenic, primarily it's because they uh, received some of the bad cassette of genes from, from the environment through this horizontal gene transfer. So example is a recent outbreak uh, in, in, in Germany where E. coli, which is normally a, a benign bacterium, acquired a, a, a pathogenic cassette and killed uh, you know, 50 people and infected 4,000. Uh, probably even more practically important is the antibiotic resistance, which is uh, really a massive problem right now, and it's getting only worse because we are using antibiotics all the time. So to put some numbers on it, uh, which I recently got off the, uh, you know, of the, of the relevant resource, uh, about 2 million people in the U.S. are infected with antibiotic resistance bacteria, and about 23,000 die every year. So Understanding how this horizontal gene transfer happens between bacteria would allow us at least to contemplate ways to reduce the spread of antibiotic resistance. So how, which highways of transfer of genes we can block so that you know, we, we can delay the spread of, the, of really nasty antibiotic resistant cassettes. So my own introduction to this field of uh, uh, bacterial genomics happened about uh, when it was six years ago or so, when my colleague at Brookhaven, Bill Studier, uh, came to my office with roughly this, uh, this distribution, this histogram. What is shown here is the following. So he was working with a particular strain of E. coli, which is a common gut bacterium. And he compared the strain he was working in. The strain had finally had its genome fully sequenced. And he compared this, the, the genome of his strain to the genome of another very popular lab strain, which was sequenced a long time ago. And basically, he discovered that they are rather similar to each other. They share almost, 40, uh, almost 4,000 genes, and uh, those genes are arranged in roughly the same order on the chromosome, so nothing, no surprises were in terms of the genome content. But then he went further and asked on a gene-by-gene -gene basis how many uh, single base pairs are different within a particular gene between those two strains. And that's what is called in a biological jargon the number of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms per gene. So what is, this is exactly what is plotted on the x-axis. So uh, roughly one-third of the genes in the genome had exactly zero SNPs, meaning they were exactly identical on their nucleotide level between those two strains. But there were some genes which had almost 100 SNPs. And 100 SNPs is a lot because the gene, as I said before, is roughly 1,000 base pairs long. So 100 would mean 10% of its, uh, of its uh, letters are replaced. So those are very, very highly uh, sort of uh, substituted genes. And what's, what, 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 he, what he got interested in is the particular form of this distribution. Notice that it's, on a, it's, it's plotted here on a logarithmic scale. So the y-axis is being in, in decades. So we have, this is 1,000, this is 100, this is 10, this is 1. And as you can see, there is this massive peak here. Roughly half of the genome belongs to this peak. And all of those genes have 0, 1, or 2, or 3 genes, or SNPs, SNPs per gene. So they are very, very conserved. And then the, remain, the remaining half of the genome has a variable number of SNPs, 
which is considerably larger and going all the way up to 100. And something significant happens around three SNPs per genome. So after, uh, you know, after sort of, uh, uh, I don't understand why it's not colored appropriately. Anyhow, so after thinking about it for a while and after bouncing off uh, various explanations in, uh, you know, explaining this type of the distribution, we figured out that what is going on is that all the genes, or most of the genes in this tail, which have a lot of SNPs, are actually, were horizontally transferred from other strains to either B or K12, and after some thinking we can tell which one was the recipient strain of those genes. And they were integrated into a genome by what, uh, in a computer, you know, in a word language would be a copy and replace type of process. So when you are getting a new collection of genomic information from some other organism, you have two options. Either you can copy insert it, and by doing this you will insert it in the genome, and you will suddenly get a new piece of a genome where you didn't have anything before. Or you can use it as a copy and replace when you're, say, replacing a, a chapter of your Word document with another chapter which you wrote somewhere else and you suddenly decided that the, the chapter you wrote somewhere else is much better than the chapter you had here. You just highlight everything you had uh, uh, before and you copy and replace it with a new version of the chapter. So that happens in biology too and uh, the, the, the biological term for this is homo well, when, when it happens this way it's, it's, it's known as homologous recombination of, uh, of, uh, of a horizontally transferred segment. So our explanation was that uh, all of the genes in the stale were homologously recombined into the strain from some other strains from the population. Okay, so uh, uh, that was when we just worked with two genomes, and we published it in six years ago, and so, and it took us a while, because my collaborator is very, very meticulous, so he wanted all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed, so finally, just shortly before I came here, we published another paper, where instead of two genomes, we worked with 32 genomes. All of them are E. coli strains, so all of them are parts of the same species. If you want them to map them onto your human intuition, we remembered 32 representatives of the population, of human population, okay? Um, and uh, and uh, uh, this is the evolutionary tree uh, connecting them together. Uh, 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 what is important is that now, having a population, we are, instead of having a still picture of evolution, so when we work with just two genomes, we have a sort of a still shot of evolution. Those are two genomes which were evolving apart from each other for X you know, amount of years or generations, and we just have one snapshot. When you have a tree like this, you can make a little bit like a, like a GIF movie, right? And I will show you this GIF movie of evolution of bacterial genomes in the next slide. So let's start with a very closely related pair of strains. You very clearly see this uh, peak, which is uh, uh, parts of the, the genes which were vertically inherited, and this tail, which is horizontally transferred. As you increase the level of divergence, you have a somewhat fatter peak of the vertically inherited genes and some more higher prefactor of horizontally transferred. So you get more and more, larger and larger fraction of your genome is covered by those uh, transferred segments. So it keeps going on for a while, at least somewhere around 1.1% divergence. You stop seeing the peak anymore. And then after this, you are just basically keep covering genomes which are already covered by horizontally transferred segments to cover them more and more. And that goes on for a while until at this level of divergence, 2.5% divergence on average, genome-wide average, uh, you ran out of sequences which people call E. coli. And then after this, it stops being E. coli and starts being another species. Okay? So this is what we published uh, just this year, even though we were working on it for three, four years before that. But uh, my, my, my group and I are now sort of taking it to another level. So right now we are working with, uh, uh, well, we started working with several hundreds of, uh, of strains. And right now we are sort of ramping it up to be able to work with 1,600 E. coli uh, genomes. And that's about as many E. coli genomes as we have in public databases right now, in all public databases we can lay our hand on. And what I show here is roughly the same picture I was showing before. 
except because I now have 5,000 pairs, I, I'm not limited to this GIF animation. I can watch a high dimensional movie of bacterial evolution. You can see how the evolution proceeds from a very closely related strains, how they gradually accumulate horizontally transferred segments up, up, up. At this point, they are completely covered by segments. And what I don't show here is we have another, you know, 10,000 or so pairs which are relating uh, this particular group of E. coli to other groups. And then I will start, you know, I will start seeing this peak developed. So the color of this rainbow corresponds to a level of divergence. So I can sort of play it as a high dimensional movie if you want. And by playing this movie, I can learn quite a bit about how universal and how, what are the peculiar properties of the evolution and what are the universal properties. So, but I, I, I preached modeling here, and all I was showing you so far are the data. So I, of course, the data, you need really to play with data first before you start modeling. But then after we proceed to the level of modeling, being physicists, we are really geared towards constructing the simplest model possible. So here is our little uh, sort of toy model of bacterial evolution by horizontal gene transfer. We follow the evolution of a pair of strains, strain one and strain two. This little reference frame here is just a convenient a way for me to keep track of which parts of the genomes are uh, changed and which remain the same as they were when those two strains were, uh, you know, those are two daughter strains of one mother, of one mother strain. So just imagine that a bacteria just divided and gave rise to two daughters. And then I follow it over, you know, tens of thousands to a million years. And then the mutations pop up every now and then. And when the mutation in strain one pops up, I'm getting a SNP. So I mark this particular place as a SNP. And then occasionally one of, or, or the other of those two strains receive a, a recombined segment from another strain. So this blue strain down here is something outside of this pair of strains, somewhere in the population. And I have this segment of roughly, as we discovered, about three, four K, KB long on average. Which would be uh, which would be recombined, and of course this the entire segment now has a uh, has a subset of the segment which which is SNPs, and then another SNP arises in strain two, and then another recombina recombined segment is recombined into strain two. Uh, two things I want to uh, make uh, make you notice in this point. First of all, when you recombine a segment into a strain, by recombining you delete all of, the, all of the mutations which accumulated before it was recombined. So it's much like you could have worked on your Word document in two places, but once you used one of the documents as a master copy and copied it into another copy of the document, whatever changes you made there are gone. So they are lost to humanity. The other thing is that you can have, when, when, when those two recombined segments overlap, you are no longer comparing the strain one and strain two, but in fact, in this green region where they overlap, I am comparing the donor strain, the yellow strain, to a blue strain. So very quickly, you lose the memory of what happened to those individual two bacterial uh, genomes, and you start getting a sample of what happens in a population, because presumably those blue and yellow strains are some sort of representatives of the population as a whole. And what I see is that when I'm comparing a pair of genomes, I'm getting an information about the population as a whole. And that's what we see in, that's what we see in those exponential tails of the SNP distributions I was showing before. And then at some point, you run into a, 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 a limit where roughly the same genome is covered by recombined segments and nothing in this reference genome, you know, you are no longer have any memory about a, you know, clonal vertical inheritance of those two strains. And that, according to our calculations, happens when the genome diverged by roughly 1%. So, well, that allowed us, this model, as simple as it was, allowed us to reconstruct some basic parameters of bacterial evolution, such as mutation rate or recombination rate. Well, in fact, mutation rate we cannot deduce automatically. We have to get it from an experiment. But the ratio between mutation and recombination rate, as well as the length of the recombined segment and the average uh, what we call transfer efficiency is the likelihood of a recombined segment from a population to be successfully integrated into a recipient genomes. Everything we can get from the model, and just to convince you that the model does a very decent job of reproducing the empirical data, what I show on the left is this, uh, uh, the distributions from this GIF animation I was showing a few slides before. You see this green, black, red, and blue are 
uh, two pairs of bacterial genomes at a, at a, a particular level of divergence. Here are our model predictions for those distributions using those parameters I was showing you at a, at a previous slide. And as you see, uh, you know, they are uh, as good as it gets in biology, agree with, uh, with the empirical data. So this very, very simple and very basic model allowed us to condense uh, you know, the, the wealth of bacterial genomics data into just four parameters, okay? So uh, uh, E. coli, uh, even though that was uh, the, 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 the bug of choice of my collaborator at Brookhaven, Bill Studier, who did his entire career working on E. coli and very, very successful, brilliant career, he is the person to whom we owe uh, the, the really mass production of proteins in E. coli genomes. He developed a technique called T7 phage polymerase uh, mass production of uh, proteins using T7 phage polymerase. So anyhow, but we are now looking at other, other, uh, other bugs which are known to recombine frequently with each other. This particular bug is responsible for a majority of uh, uh, upset stomachs worldwide, and sometimes it gets really nasty, and occasionally it even kills people, especially in, uh, in developing countries. Uh, so uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, several thousands of strains of some of the species. I'm not sure about this one in particular. I think this particular rainbow diagram we constructed using uh, less than 100 of the genomes of this bug, and uh, that gives us about uh, 5,000 of comparisons. Uh, but right now we are working on, uh, on, on species which have a large collection of strains, and to do this we actually need... Uh, some low-end access to a supercomputing time. So here is a, a little back-of-the-envelope estimate. To analyze uh, a species with uh, E. coli has about 1,600 strains, which, convert, which means that they have so ma that many pairs of, uh, pairs of strains. When we do a pairwise alignment, where we align a pair of strains, strain genomes along with a reference genome, takes about two minutes on a one-core computer. So we are talking about uh, you know, 40,000 core hours. Right? But that's just one species. So if you have, I don't know, 10, 15 species, that, that quickly adds up. And that's where we would actually need, uh, 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 you know, Blue Waters or, or its descendants to help us with this task. All right. Now I change gears. Uh, so I, I finished the part of my talk where I was talking about evolutionary dynamics of bacterial genomes. And now I, I shift towards much more sort of human scale of population dynamics, but it still will be about bacteria primarily and their viruses, bacteriophages. So all of the works I present are really hot off the press. Here are the two things we published this year and the other one which we are working on, finalizing. Um, so, but before I sort of jump into this modeling, I want to uh, uh, put a pitch to the society, we, my collaborator and I started this International Society of Bottom-Down Modelers. So we all heard about uh, top-down models and bottom-up models. That's usually what people do. What we advocate is that, uh, in fact, the, the right way, well, there is no unique right way, but one interesting way to model really, really complex phenomena is, is what we call bottom-down. Namely, you start with a simple model, and then you make it even simpler. You strip it off all the parameters as much as possible. And the, the only requirement is that the stripped down model would still reproduce a set of selected empirical observations which you find particularly interesting about your complex system. And you know, in order to be admitted to our society, we, we, we give grades for your parameter, for, for the models. And of course, the best model has zero parameters. For this, you get A plus and a Per Bach Memorial Award. Per Bach is my mentor. Uh, unfortunately, he died about 10 years ago. He was my mentor at Brookhaven Lab. One parameter gives you an A, two parameters B, three parameters C, and then four parameters don't bother showing up. So standard model is not in this competition. So they failed. They have whatever, 20, 120 parameters. I don't remember exactly. Uh, now, uh, so here is what, what we, we, we I will. I will show you a couple of bottom-down models, and then uh, maybe uh, 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 once you have a bottom-down model to anchor your science, you can sort of uh, generate descendants of this model, and that's where you can start adding parameters one at a time. So what we are trying to model is are the following. Those are three, uh, you know, three examples, real-life examples, which we kept in mind when we constructed our model. We want to be able to model communities of microbes which are exposed to sudden and 
dramatic collapses where population changes by many orders of magnitude. And also those community is competing for a single limiting resource. So in a way, it always uh, sort of in the state where all of the resources gobbled up by, by, by the community as a whole. And of course, you know, a, a company's competing for a market share uh, is another uh, uh, example of this process in economics, right? And of course, in order to reproduce this collapse in dynamics, we need to think about some extremely volatile market, you know, uh, uh, sector of the economy where the collapses, bankruptcies happen all the time. And then uh, uh, I also, in my uh, distant, distant past, my PhD was done on some uh, simple models of uh, biological evolution, and some of the aim of those models were to reproduce uh, mass extinction events in a paleontological record. So that is another thing which we kept in mind when we were constructing the model, right? Again, just to give you a, a couple of plots which shows that what we are thinking about is not too far-fetched. This is a plot from, uh, from, a, uh, from a paper, 1999 paper from THG Lab, uh, which shows that they followed a bacterial community in a particular, uh, I think it was a, uh, some sewage system or something, where, where they uh, saw how bacterial community composition was changing over time, and this is measured in days. So when you, uh, something like 325 days elapsed between this and this point, and 437 days elapsed between this and this, so year and year and a half. And then suddenly you can see that how this uh, green population of one particular species of, you know, or uh, evolutionary group of bacteria suddenly collapsed dramatically. And then some of the uh, communities which were minor in those two samples grew and kept growing otherwise. So you see those changes all the time in real ecosystems. And in bacterial communities, they happen at a faster time scale. Here is another paper which gives us motivation that uh, this uh, David Kirchman and his lab studied uh, microbial communities in uh, marine, uh, uh, you know, wild communities in uh, Delaware uh, uh, Bay and uh, other, uh, you know, along the Delaware coast, other microbial communities in the marine systems. And they saw that over half of the bacterial taxa, which is, you know, evolutionary groups, actively cycle between extremely abundant and extremely rare. So you see those rapid, rapid changes, and they also refer to something which is called kill the winner hypothesis. This is a model which was proposed about you know, five years before that, which essentially told that if your population as a bacteria, you know, bacterial population is particularly large, you represent a very nice and juicy target for, uh, for viruses. And the viruses primarily go towards, you know, they are biased towards large populations, bacteria with large populations. And again, uh, for those of you who are computer scientists or just use Windows, we all know that, you know, part of the reason why uh, uh, Microsoft Windows is a popular target of viruses is because the community using Microsoft Windows is huge. There are other things, you know, with being more vulnerable and so on and so forth. But now as Mac systems propagated and probably uh, it started to be comparable in size, then uh, bacterial virus writers would also target their viruses to, to, to Mac system. Okay, so this is the only equation I will show you today. Uh, we are sort of modeling a, a group of N populations. PI is a population size. And they compete for the same resource. And what, uh, the way we model it is that we have this parameter, which we call K, and the uh, biological term for this is the carrying capacity of the environment. So as soon as the total size of all populations in your environment adds up to K, all of them stop growing. So in other words, they gobbled up all the resources, and now they are just in this maintenance mode where they barely change. And then every now and then there is this violent noise, and as I said, this eta I, even though it's an innocent term, in reality it means a dramatic collapse by orders of magnitude, right? So then I preached the bottom-down model, and so we started stripping up the models from parameters. So omega and k are not needed, so both were set to one. The only parameter we, we turn out we still need is this how large is a collapse. So by what factor the population changes down when, uh, when this particular population collapses. Okay, so this is one parameter of the model. And we also have the number of species in our model, which you can say it's a system size. Right? This is a little time course of our model. Each one of those ribbons is a population of one species. We have 20 species in this particular ecosystem, and we see those uh, 
collapses of a dominant population, and we also see that this population is growing due to collapses of other populations because we are in this uh, saturated environment where the only way you can grow is to gobble up something, some resources which were vacated by other populations which collapsed. Okay, and then we discovered something which we call diversity waves. And the diversity wave is the following observation that uh, roughly speaking, the ecosystem dynamics in our model proceeds as follows. So you start, prepare the model with roughly, uh, you know, comparable abundances of all the species. And then they start being uh, wiped out one by one by those random collapse events. And when they are wiped out, they are sent down to the bottom of the population distribution, and it takes them a while to recover. In fact, uh, at some point, uh, the community will be dominated by just one species, which will be occupying the vast majority of all the resources. But sooner or later, this species, which is the current king in the community, will also collapse. And then a revolution will come up. All those species, downtrodden species at the bottom part of the distribution, will suddenly be moved up. And there will be a, you know, a big revolution. They will enjoy happy life together until they start collapsing one by one again. So this is this diversity wave. So we start with a high diversity. The diversity exponentially decreases due to populations being removed. And then jump. This is a big revolution. One diversity wave ends, and another one starts. And again, things repeat itself. Okay, so one way to look at it is to look at the species abundance distribution. That's what ecosystem people do a lot. In our particular model, if you do a aggregate species abundance distribution, that means, roughly speaking, if we follow our system over a course of time, and then we collect the species abundance distribution at different time points, and we put them all together, what we end up is a, a, a bimodal distribution, but I also want you to see that it's extremely broad. So this is a logarithm of population numbers, and they are in a model distributed over many, many orders of magnitude. It also has this power law regime up there, which is something which a lot of uh, 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 empirically observed communities seem to have. So the abundant species often have this power law distribution of abundances. But we also have this sort of, it only goes up to a point, then it reaches a peak, and then, uh, and then we have those two peaks. So we can call it, uh, you know, haves and have-nots. And the haves are being eliminated one by one, so the species are being moved from the upper peak to the lower peak until there is only one species in the upper peak. And at this point, a revolution happens, and uh, all of the species in the lower peak are moving to the upper peak. So that's a big upheaval in the system, which is, you know, comparable to a revolution. So this is uh, to show you how big an upheaval it is. The green curve shows you the species abundance distribution just before this major revolution happens. So there is one species up there, which is not even visible, but there is one species in the distribution. And then this uh, broad, roughly power lowish distribution of all the species in the lower one, uh, in the lower part of the distribution. And then this one king is being killed and this entire green curve is being moved up there, and it becomes a red curve. So that's how the system looks like in the beginning of the new era when uh, revolutionaries took over the old regime. Okay? So again, we were bottom-down modelers at heart, so we thought, well, maybe we can make the model even simpler. Let's just make sure that when the revolution happens, we will divide all the resources equally between the surviving species, right? So let's make the revolution honest. So everybody, after, in the end of the revolution, will get exactly one over n share of resources. And then we plotted the dynamics in the model using some measure, and it turned out to be exceedingly boring, completely reproducible. And that told us, no, no, that, that cannot be. The model cannot be simplified any further, because when you start simplifying a model and you lose the interest in parts of the dynamics, yeah, that's the wrong way to simplify a model. For comparison, that's the same sort of diversity of the population which we have in, an, in our actual model, and that's in a simplified model, okay? So you see a lot of the interesting phenomena happening within each of the diversity wave. Moreover, what we learned from doing this exercise is that we naively thought that one, one kind of wave ends and new one begins, so whatever happens in a previous wave, in a past wave, is history, it no longer has any influence on our system, and it will be forgotten. By looking at those curves, we, sh we saw that there is, in fact, quite a bit of memory. So you see this gap persists roughly unchanged for four waves, five waves, and only in a wave number six, it somehow collapses. So again, you know, we thought about it for a while, we realized that there is an inherent 
intrawave dialectics. So again, translating it to uh, something which is a sort of a, a societal image I want you to live with. So when the revolution happens, before the revolution happens, whatever happens to upper classes is being imprinted in the lower classes. After the revolution, the lower classes come to power and they don't come tabula rasa. They come with this imprinted population structure which they inherited from being the lower classes during the previous wave. So two sort of uh, uh, images come to mind. One is that this, you know, British TV dramas and American TV dramas, I guess both of them are British, which, uh, which is obsessed with the class society of, of the British society, you know, upstairs and downstairs. And whatever happens upstairs is being mimicked by the ones downstairs. So when they will come to power, and that's another image. So when the revolution happens and the lower classes come to power, they tend to repeat the history and it takes several revolutions before it's completely wiped out. You know, French know it, Russians know it, and uh, you should remember it too. Okay, so uh, I am getting close to the end of my talk. I guess there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, so, as I said, uh, you know, bottom-down models are great. They can get you a very interesting rich dynamics in a model where you can actually understand where it's coming from. You can start playing with this model. You can start sort of deleting, removing bits and pieces, adding bits and pieces of the model and seeing what changes. If nothing changes, great. If something changes, interesting. So, but uh, I always quote uh, Groucho Marx, so it's another type of a Marxism, right? Uh, 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 those are my principles. If you don't like them, well, I have others. So Kim Snappen, who is my uh, partner in crime in those modelings, liked this quote so much that he adopted as a motto for the Center for Models of Life he runs at the Copenhagen University at the Niels Bohr Institute. So, uh, uh, so after we've done our bottom-down model, we started looking for variants. Some of them are not bottom-down anymore. Some have more than three parameters. Uh, those are sort of not interesting to any of, any of you who are not biologists. But since I put those three models in my title, I, I, I have to tell you a bit about them. So kill the loser model. So kill the loser model was a variant of the model we, we, we thought about when we tried to think if our model actually applies to economic sectors. So the basic premise of our bottom-down model was that any population has exactly the same chance of being wiped out in a collapse as any other population. So they are all equally likely to, to succumb to this phage or something, to this virus. And of course, if you think about companies, we know that the larger companies are somewhat less likely to collapse than, uh, than the smaller ones. And we wanted to see what happens when, uh, when we put a bias, which biases collapses towards smaller companies. And the larger companies still occasionally collapse, but not as often as, 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 as the small ones. Now, kill the winner model was a direct sort of uh, 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 directly relevant to microbial population dynamics. As I said, that's a, that's a buzzword in microbial ecosystem dynamics. And that's essentially the idea is that if you are a virus and you're aiming, you know, selecting a population to infect, you're evolving to infect a particular population, uh, you know, the larger populations are more attractive targets. So there is a bias which goes in exactly the opposite uh, direction than kill the loser model. And then in a kill the king model, we wanted to go all the way to some extreme level. What if the virus always wipes up the largest population? So what if you always go after the richest person in the country to kill, right? Then what, whatever happens, uh, uh, of course, it used to be the king. Now it's, I guess, somebody else, but I don't want to go into details here. So let's see what happens in a kill the loser model. As I said, it's, uh, it's relevant for companies somewhat. And moreover, we, we took the empirical data on, uh, uh, on a probability of a, of a large collapse as a function of a market capitalization of the company, which goes down as a power law, but not terribly steep. So much less steep than one would expect, right? So that's why we see Enron and others collapsing every now and then. So the gray curve here is our basic, uh, you know, uh, one parameter model. And, uh, and the blue curve is our new model with this one extra parameter, well, which we fixed at minus 0 0.2. Well, we see that the have-nots get even poorer, right? So if you are wiping them out all the time, if your type of social justice in our systems at the moment you raise rose up a little bit above the uh, you know, the poverty level, you're being pushed down again. 
would generate a much sort of more narrow distribution here. But the upper part of the distribution remained virtually unchanged. So this power law, you know, didn't change much at all. So that's good news because whenever we see something universal that gives us hope that we can observe it in real life systems. Okay? Now, the kill the winner model turned out to be very, very different. So we started by very, very slightly biasing the uh, probability of a collapse towards larger populations. This parameter alpha, much in the spirit of the kill the loser model, but now it's a positive exponent. So now, the larger is my population, the more likely I am to collapse. And when we push it down to 0.01, we basically see the same as in, in, without this bias. But the moment we push to something real, this two-peak structure disappears. And at alpha equal to 1, which is what most people have in mind when they talk about kill the winner model, uh, it's completely flat. In fact, this being completely flat led us to investigate this particular model in detail. That's what we are working on right now, the kill the king model. So what is shown here is the population dynamics in a model where we always go after the largest population completely deterministically. And we start at some uh, you know, broad distribution of population sizes between 10 to the power minus 10 and 1. Okay, they always add up to 1. This is dynamics of the model. That's uh, each step here is a full cycle. That's n collapses, where all populations collapse one after another in a, in a sequence. The sequence is repeatable from cycle to cycle. So revolutions here are perfectly reproducible. So always the same populations happen in the same steps. And then, you know, sooner or later, you will end up equidistantly distributed. So the logarithmic distance between those populations on, the, on this axis becomes identical after a while. What happened also is that it's described by Berger equation. Those of you who work on turbulence, and I guess there might be one or two people in the audience who work on turbulence, because turbulence is very kind of uh, popular among the, you know, a popular topic to simulate on high performance computers. So people know about a Berger equation, and in fact, we were working on this version of the equation when we were, uh, Kim Snepin and I were on a train from Bremen to Copenhagen, and it was happened to be exactly at Hamburg, so we called it Hamburger equation, okay? It's a, an isotropic version of the Berger equation, for those of you who know. Anyhow, so the, the take home messages of this, poor, of this part is that the bottom down models can unexpectedly give to very, very rich and interesting dynamics, in particular on our sort of basic bottom down model, we have four time scales. We have this uh, time scale which we don't even explicitly model, but we keep in mind that whenever the resources are vacated, all the populations grow exponentially to gobble them up until they gobble them up and sort of freeze at this new stationary state. So this is very rapid growth. Then, of course, at intermediate time scales, the population remain constant, so there is no dynamics, but there is still time scale. Then on a n log n time scale, where n is the number of populations, we have those diversity wave. n log n is the average duration of a diversity wave. That's how many collapses it takes for the species to go through a full cycle. And unexpectedly, we also discovered that there is a memory between so the revolutions. On average, it takes log n revolutions to completely wipe out the memory of what happened a long time ago. Okay, so those are the four time scales. And finally, uh, kill the winner or kill the king models are different from these dynamics, and they have those periodic oscillations, which are interesting because you, you see quite often the periodic oscillations in ecosystem dynamics. But what is special about those oscillations is that the order in which uh, populations oscillate is, can be anything. It's a frozen accident of, what, of their sizes early on in the uh, dynamics of the system. So it's time to acknowledge my collaborators. So as I said, uh, KBase is a large project. I already introduced the leaders, Mark Gerstin at Yale, Doreen Ware, and Mike Schatz at Cold Spring Harbor, and my uh, main sort of collaborators at Brookhaven are Shinja Yu and Fei He. Fei is uh, my postdoc who followed me here to, uh, uh, to Urbana, and Shinja was uh, left behind at, uh, at Brookhaven. Homologous recombination, you already saw uh, my postdoc, former postdoc, Purushadam Dixon, who is now a postdoc at Columbia. Uh, Tin Yaopang, a very talented PhD student who is now doing postdoc in Germany. Bill Studier is this, uh, you know, really world famous scientist at Brookhaven who, uh, who got interested in bacterial genomics, even though he primarily does experiments with bacteria. Many of you know Rich Lensky, who is uh, uh, famous. He is sort of our distant neighbor at Michigan State. 
who is doing this long-term evolutionary experiments on E. coli. He has the populations of E. coli, which he kept over, I forgot, 50,000 generations or something. And, uh, and uh, uh, Patrick and uh, uh, Jin Huyen, who did the sequencing and bioinformatics analysis. Uh, this is a project I mentioned, the big data in genomics. And Kill the Winner is a really a, a bootstrap uh, sort of model uh, uh, with Kim Snap and just two physicists playing, playing around during my summer visits to Copenhagen. So now I'm ready to answer your questions. Thanks very much. Um, well, I'll shout. I don't, I don't <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, yeah, we can. Uh, one of the, in, in your first part of your talk, one of your parameters, uh, or kinds of parameters, was base pairs per generation. Mm -hmm. And yet you're talking, so generation is normally conceived as vertical transmission, but you're, a lot of what you're talking about is horizontal gene transfer. So how do you think about the concept of generation in a world of horizontal transfer, and how does that affect? Right, right, and that, that's, uh, when I said that we can sort of reconstruct four parameters, I immediately put a disclaimer. In fact, for some of the parameters, we only know the ratio. So what we, what we, what we can deduce from our modeling is the ratio between the rate of recombination per generation to rate of mutation per generation. Or you can equally well say that it would be a, the ratio of those rates per thousand years, right? As long as you are not talking about some very long time intervals when they start to saturate. What matters is the ratio between the rates. But it turned out that the really interesting parameter, which the community uses a lot, is not just the ratio of the rates, but rather the following parameter. It's known in the field as R over M. Uh, now, what it means is that let's compare two bacterial genomes, which are, you know, recombining with the population, and if they haven't diverged completely, so we can still separate the vertical parts of the genome and horizontal parts, I can ask how many SNPs, how many single nucleotide polymorphins were horizontally transferred, and how many are vertically inherited. And it turns out that this ratio between those numbers is roughly independent of time, uh, since divergence, until they start saturating. So this ratio is sort of a universal parameter which signifies how much more important horizontally transferred uh, variation from vertically important ones. So for E. coli, this number is between 7 and 12. So roughly speaking, the horizontal transfer is 10 times more efficient, uh, more important. It brings 10 times more variation than vertical mutations within this lineage. For other bacterial genomes, it's different, even though this 10 to 20 range is very, very common one. There are other bacterial genomes which are stay away from recombination, and then this number will be below one. So I'm interested in the growth phase. So you're assuming that everything's growing exponentially at an equal rate. And I wondered if there is a feedback effect where in some environments, you might not expect it in all environments, that becoming more dominant is in itself a benefit where you may use quorum sensing or antibiotic production to use your dominance to kill off the others. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good point. Again, this is one of the features we thought about adding to our basic model. So uh, frequency-dependent selection, uh, which would be positive in a sense that if you, are, if you achieve the uh, large market share of, so to say, of an ecosystem, then you you are beyond just a linear effect. Your domination goes beyond the linear effect. We see it all the time in computer software, right? You know, nobody would bother to install some obscure, you know, or very few people will bother to install uh, obscure software which is really subdominant because that will limit your ability to exchange information. So, in fact, we are thinking about sort of a marriage between the two parts of my talk to add a horizontal gene transfer to this population model in which you would, uh, the horizontal gene transfer would encourage, actually, to be the dominant population because you are getting extra evolutionary advantage from being able to exchange gene cassettes with other members. Whereas, you know, if you are a minority, then you are... Uh, of course, kings would love to know when they are going to be decapitated. Uh, do you have, are you considering studying uh, tipping points and early warning signals for when these things are going to happen? In well, your, your models, bioinformation processing metrics? 
That would violate my principle of bottom-down model. It's a very interesting point you're raising, and in fact, if my uh, sort of focus of the model would be on exactly how this sort of collapse happens, we, we have a model, in fact, where we, where we uh, uh, the other model I mentioned in my introductory slide, where we, we talk about bet hedging and how viruses which have sort of several strategies are selecting between the strategies of either rapidly killing the host or staying dormant and what are the uh, game theoretical optimal you know, mixed strategy. So that, that, that goes a little bit in the direction of this uh, tipping point in a sense when your population becomes uh, so large that, in fact, you know, I have one kind of uh, a reasonable way to, to respond to your question that we have been thinking about it in biological context mostly, even though I was using the social analogy. And one of the ideas we had is that this uh, kill the king model may have a real sort of ecosystem implications that you can imagine that a population is growing, and then at a certain point it reaches like a percolation threshold. So a, a threshold which is a minimum required for some uh, 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 virus to propagate within this population. And then according to our predictions, this model will be quickly wiped out by an infection, right? Because the phages are evolved rapidly. And so one limit of the model where the tipping point would be exactly the population density, minimum population density uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to enable the spread of a virus. And that, that, would, uh, that would be something when we will be writing up this uh, kill the king model, that would be one kind of justification. Because otherwise it's very hard to imagine that you know, something, some god decides let me kill the king. But if it's, a, if it's a percolation phenomenon and if all the populations are very sort of widespread in their abundance, then the first one to reach the threshold will be, will be eliminated. So you, you kind of reach the tipping point, you're gone. Okay, I think that any further questions can be directed during uh, refreshments. And thanks again, Sergey, for giving us the